There we go. Are you, I think you're still muted, Pamela. I'm just hiding the snuffling. Oh, are you hiding the snuffling? Yes. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, Fraser and I both came home from our cruise to the end of the world uh, with, with our own variety of creeping crud, virus, vector, plague. And uh, so there, this will be the episode of careful use of muting to, to hide yeah. the snuffling, coughing, yeah. sneezing, insert bacterial generated noise of your choice. I was I was at the uh, I was at the the drugstore last night and it was like a bomb had gone off. It was just like like the uh, like I don't know like zombie hordes had come through looking for uh, ibuprofen and and various drugs. It was quite something. So yeah, I know it's it's going around for sure. Um, I so far I've avoided the flu, but I've definitely got the cold. So. Yeah, I, I was highly amused. I Nicole Gallucci, noisy astronomer, and I are going to Science IO in a couple of weeks, and and today we got a tweet: "Get your flu shots before you come to Science IO." And it was like, oh, too late. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, I hear th I hear this this year's flu shot is actually quite effective. It's like ninety percent effective. Well, previous years the, like the Canadian 10%. strains maybe in the U.S. it's only being about sixty to six, sixty six to sixty nine percent effective, depending on whose numbers you read. I've heard this year is particularly effective, and uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Canadian, uh, no, not Canadian not germs. Thing. No, no, I, I, I heard it on some U.S. thing. I forget now, so I, I can't verify the source. Um, well, hey, it's great to be back in our normal recording situation in our cold, terribly cold <laughs> <laughs> locations. <laughs> So cold. It's true. Yes, yeah. it's, we we love you all so much that in the winter we freeze to death recording in unheated areas of our house that are nicely quiet. Yeah, the only thing I, I use this part of the house for is to record uh, live shows, and then I zip back up to the uh, kitchen table where I have the heat going, and uh, yeah, it's good. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It was sure was nice to be in uh, in sunny uh, Bahamas, etc. For uh, to do this cruise, so. If anyone, so if anyone's wondering kind of the weird numbering, we're on 287, um, and the last episode that should be po posted into our feed is probably 283. Uh, we recorded three episodes uh, when we were on the cruise, on the end of the, not the end of the world cruise. So those are going to be uh, sort of edited and polished up and, and thrown into the feed as well. So that's going to be 284, 285, and 286. Yes. We had we had one episode on optics and two episodes on uh, on the end of the world, uh, both the uh, the ways that the world will actually end and also a, sort of how to debunk a world ending myth and uh, and that was great it was it was it was really fun it was the first time we'd actually ever done a live show which was quite uh, quite something quite a it was quite a bizarre experience to do that we 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 learned we can be funny if there's an audience to laugh at our jokes if you want to call it funny then that's fine. Uh, we learned that we can be snide and make people laugh with our sarcasm if there's an audience to laugh. Right, right, exactly. It it uh, it definitely worked. So I I think we're going to try and do more and more of this kind of live stuff. You know, got got as always big plans, big plans. But, and uh, and for those of you who are wondering about future travels, we're we're in the process of uh, starting the organization for January of 2014. Volcanoes and telescopes in Hawaii. Dates and details to follow. Yeah. And um, so I'm yeah, working our, on the website right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, doing this cruise was fantastic. We had a wonderful time, but we also realized that a cruise is possibly the worst possible platform for doing any kind of astronomical work. Uh, you know, you you travel during the night. And you stop during the day, which is backwards. You know, you really, uh, you carry around your own cloud of light pollution, which is no good. Uh, so you know, we couldn't even see the Milky Way from the back of the ship. So it was, it was mediocre seeing it at best. The ship moves, so you can't put yes. a telescope down. I, you know, so it was, it was great for the various archaeological stuff, uh, but. Uh, it was definitely not um, not a good thing for astronomy. So this time around, we're going to like, what's the best place in the world to go? What would be the best way to do it? How can we pull all our secrets, you know, you know, secret contacts and get access into really cool places? And so, check things off of our personal bucket list. Yeah, so let's yeah, not yeah, deny well, the reality of Pamela wants to go see volcanoes. 
I want to, you know, exactly. I want to sort of, you know, stick my eye right up to the Gemini North, and they don't you know. have a t they don't have an eyepiece on Gemini North. <laughs> I might be able to swing it so that you can touch it, but there's okay. no eyepiece. That'll be fine. That'll be fine. But also, I mean, just to set up some telescopes outside the big observatories, and then just do a night of that, or teach people. You know, everyone bring their DSLR cameras, and we'll do a big tutorial on getting really beautiful Milky Way shots and. And so on and so forth. So I think that's that's the plan. And hopefully it'll even be a little less expensive maybe than the cruise thing. So we'll we'll figure this out. We're working um, on details. Yeah, yeah. But it was it was great. So once again, we're gonna do our recording of today's episode, uh, E equals MC squared, where we'll go into detail about how the uh, famous uh, equation from Albert Einstein. When that's finished, we'll stick around for, you know, half an hour or so and, and answer questions that you might have about space and astronomy or the show that we just talked about. Now, there's a bunch of ways that you can participate. Uh, if you're watching this on Google Plus on the event page, you can make a comment there. Uh, you can also make a comment if you're seeing where I sort of dropped it in my stream, uh, if you're watching it there. And of course, uh, you can, if you're watching this somewhere that's not on Google Plus, you can always make a comment on Twitter with the hashtag astronomy cast and then the last place and this is kind of the safest is to make a comment over on YouTube so if you're if you're in any way watching this video embedded anywhere you can click the little, on the bottom right and it'll say t watching YouTube and then from there you'll see all the YouTube comments and uh, and you can and you can make your comments there so uh, that's the one that I has is the highest chance that you're gonna see it because it's it's baked right into the uh, to the hangout that we're, we're using so we absolutely see the ones that go on YouTube Everywhere else, I, I can't promise I'll spot your comment. So if we make a horrible mistake, by all means, uh, catch us and uh, fix it. And uh, and if we uh, and then if you have some some ideas or suggestions, I'll try to incorporate them into the show. Um, and uh, as always, take all the credit. Um, and then uh, we'll stick around after. And and, and and I just have one comment on that. If, if things are baked into the hangout, why are we so expletive cold? I think they're frozen into the hangout. Frozen into the hangout, exactly. Um, okay, cool. All right. Well, I'm. Uh, I am ready to go. You ready to go? I I believe I am. Except I'm not star I'm not mono. Let me go mono. I am now mono. I am now actually ready. Okay. Say when. I am pressing the button. Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna wait for this computer of yours to It it actually started relatively quickly. Okay. It's Great. going, it's recording. Excellent. All right. Well I'm recording as well. Okay. Um all right, here we go. Oops. Okay. Astronomy Cast, episode 287 for Monday, December 31st, 2012. E equals MC squared. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good, and we're back from our awesome cruise uh, are. in the Caribbean uh, with, uh, I guess, about 90 of our Astronomy Cast friends, and that was super it, fun. Yes, and, and we are going to be repeating this. Look forward yes. for news about Hawaii in January 2014. Uh, I'm working on putting together a website for that, and um, all the photos from this year will go up and information on next year will follow. Yeah, it was a really wonderful experience. I got to say, I'm a big thanks to the folks who did the end of the world cruise for inviting us on board and 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 letting us participate. We had a great time, uh, you know, both with being able to sort of see the ruins and do the excursions, but also just to be able to spend time with with the Astronomy Cast fans. It was great. We you put together a really busy schedule where um, we were recording shows almost every night. Uh, we were or doing events every night, meet and greet, party, doing shows. We did stargazing every night out on the back of the boat. We uh, we did uh, lunches and dinners with the fans. We were able to get a chance to to actually hang out with almost everybody who who came and and have uh, sort of personal dinner and, and lunch with them. So it was it was great. It was great to get to know everybody and great to to of course to hang out with uh, with you and. You know, the families got together. Uh, it was a really fantastic time, and I was—I uh, I can't wait to do that again. And and I have to send out props to to Victoria, Eric, uh, and Phoenix for for all of their help the day we went to Coba because you abandoned us, and they helped <laughs> us bring up the rear and bring up the front. Yeah, yeah, um, abandoned you. I I didn't want to send my children into that nightmare 
gale force storm. But anyway, um, you you made the right choice. Yeah, your, I know. Your children, I know. Yeah, it, yeah. It, we had the fairy ride, ride right. of evil that you yeah. can read about in the in the future on my blog. Yeah, we've got some great pictures. And so, like you said, you know, we're gonna, you know, it was a great chance to experiment, and it was great to hang out with everybody. The the downside was. It wasn't the best platform for doing astronomy-related stuff because the the boat moves at night and then it stops during the day. You're carrying around horrible light pollution. The boat is moving, so you can't set up telescopes. Uh, so it was, you know, it wasn't a great place for the, the kind of science that we want to do. So, and that's why I think we're going to look for some place that's, you know, on land that's near nice observatories and. And we'll we'll figure that out. So anyway, more news coming. Um, but just wanted to give everyone a wrap up. It was a fantastic time. Uh, okay, well, cool. Well, let's get rolling then. Uh, so, uh, so it's mind-bending to think about this, but the light in your house and the house itself are really the same thing. Matter and energy are interchangeable. This was the amazing revelation made by Albert Einstein with his famous formula, E equals mc squared. This is the process that the sun uses to turn hydrogen into radiation through fusion and the terrible danger from nuclear weapons. So I, I think I can remember that being, you know, when I sort of finally wrapped my head around this, and we did it in um, physics class in like grade 11, I think, grade 10. You know, when we were given that formula, and now we understood what that formula was about, I mean, I actually had to calculate, you know, here's your energy, how much mass, you know, will, can you make, here's your mass, how much energy can you release, that they're just, that they're interchangeable. That was, for yeah. me, it really felt like I looked the whole world in a different way, because you're so used to these things being two different things and now they're and now they're not so so can you kind of go back to this just really amazing uh, well I should first let's start with the equation itself and and sort of talk about like what is this equation saying and what is it and what is it talking about well at, at the most fundamental level what it's saying is if you take something it has a certain amount of material that makes it up and that material can get transformed into energy but the thing as a whole has a sum of energy and mass that is, is a constant. So you have the energy of an object which is tied up in its rest mass and its kinetic motion, and then you have, have the fact that if it's moving, um, its, it's matter amount doesn't change. Its matter is dictated by how many electrons, how many protons does it have, but its momentum, its ability to act like mass, um, changes and and this is a really confusing concept but the best way to think about it is if you have two observe two observers both uh, looking at the same event they need to see the same thing and since time changes based on how fast you're moving if I'm watching a train moving at close to the speed of light it would be very hard for me to watch it but ignoring that I would see time for the people on that train slowly approach a stop. This means that if someone were to drop a really nice pot, it would appear to very slowly drift towards the bottom of that very quickly moving train. Now, a very slow moving pot should just sort of gently touch the ground. But the reality is if it weighs enough when it touches the ground, there'll be no gentle about it and will shatter into a million pieces. So it's it's equivalent mass, it's relativistic mass, has to increase in order for it to shatter when it hits the ground in this I perceive time moving very slowly for the folks on this fast moving train. Now at the same time, to the people on the train, it's a normal pot, you drop the sucker moves fast, the thing shatters into a million pieces. And it's because of this, this change in relativistic mass that we both are able to perceive the exact same shattering of a pot. Right, okay. Um, so then let's actually t look at the formula itself. So let's break it down bit by bit. So let's start with the E. So what's E? Energy. 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 As measured? It's the ability of something to do work if you rest enough of the bits out of it. And typically it's measured in what? Joules? Joules, yeah. Mega joules. <laughs> you know, <laughs> calories. in this case, calories, yeah. Okay, right. Uh, e and, and then that's equal. And then M? Mass. And that's the mass in kilograms, grams. Yeah. Okay. Uh, C. Speed of light. Kilometers and, per second. Yeah. Or meters and, per second, depending on what you decide to use. And so then, the normal units are meters per second, mass in kilograms, energy in joules. 
and then you square the speed of light, and that's where it yes. gets ridiculous, right? <laughs> the speed of light is already, what, 300,000 meters per second, and yeah. then you square that number, right? And you get, well, you know... Whatever. Well, it's, it's 300 million meters per second. Yeah, 300,000 300, yeah. kilometers per second. Yes. So yeah. you take 300 million meters per second, square the sucker, and yeah, that, that's a large number. But yeah. what's neat about this is if you turn the equation around and you look at it as a ratio instead, the energy tied up in an object divided by its mass is always equal to the speed of light squared. And that's just kind of cool. But the but I mean when you think about you know for example I've got here a you know an, a nice little iron meteorite. Um, hey, I've got one of those too. I know we all do. <laughs> is we this all do. a fill plate meteorite? Hey, this is this is a fill plate thing. We yeah. have fill plate meteorites. Yeah. Yes. Yes, fill plate. Uh, if if he really likes you, will give you an iron meteorite. Um, uh, yeah, and so and so you know like maybe I forget it's about uh, forty grams or so, but I mean there is enough energy to power a city in this. Piece of for, for a brief period of yeah. time, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's a phenomenal amount of energy that's locked yeah. up in all the matter around us. In fact, it's as if everything around us is just, you know, bombs waiting Frozen to go energy? off. Frozen energy? Frozen, you know, bombs. But the trick is unlocking that energy. That's the, that's the hard part. So, so let's go back to Einstein then. So, so, I mean, you already kind of led into it, right, which is the relativity mm -hmm. concept. So, so how did Einstein really come up with this idea? Well, so what's interesting is, is there was initially no E equals MC squared in his paper. It was just kind of this sentence off to the side that um, according to the translation of the German that I stole ruthlessly from Wikipedia, it said, if a body gives off the energy L in the form of radiation, its mass diminish diminishes by L over V squared. And, and so this has to do with, with just how the momentum is affected in the process. Um, it has to do with uh, the conservation of, of kinetic energy tying into everything. And, and it was only later that Max Planck was the one who wrote that the mass initially in a system is equal to the energy initially in a system divided by C squared. And it's very important that you think of this in terms of mass and not matter, because mass and matter aren't really interchangeable. Matter is frozen energy, but when you have something, potato for instance, potato is everyone's favorite example, that, that potato is made up of a certain amount of particles, and those particles each have their, their matter. They're tied to the Higgs boson, they have a mass because of that. Um, but, but the amount of matter in it is a specific thing, and the amount of mass is, is different, and it, it's hard to sort that out because you can pull apart an atom, and depending on what it was when you started, you still have the same bits, but the energy of the bits have changed, and the mass energy is conserved, and, and the matter is, is something different, and you can actually, if you take a bunch of energy, you can turn it into matter, but the mass energy is conserved. But how did this even occur to him? Right? I mean, he it's was just a like, genius? Well, I understand that, and I guess, but I mean, you mentioned this before, right, that he was thinking about, about the implications of mass moving at relativistic speeds, that that it being equivalent to energy had to be the outcome, right? I, I, it, it falls out of the equations naturally. That, that's one of the disturbing things when you're asked to do all these homework problems in, in general relativity and special relativity is, is this is one of those things that when you start looking at um, how does momentum change as, as an object accelerates and you take into account relativistic corrections, how does the time, when you start looking at all of these different things, it just falls out naturally that you have this E over M equals C squared, and that's how it falls out naturally. It doesn't fall out as E equals MC squared, it falls out as the speed of light squared just happens to boil down to energy divided by mass. And so back when, when Einstein first first uh, proposed this this equation. Now you mentioned that Max Planck had sort of refined it. Did Einstein mm -hmm. come back around and give it its final form? Um, it, I, Einstein did return to the topic 
Um, he did write E equals MC squared in the title of one of his articles, but by the time he got around to doing it, it was already generally being used. That's one of the great things about science is, while it may take us a while to decide how we're going to generally refer to things, what we're going to name things, once that relationship is discovered, everyone uses it. And, and in, in this case, he wrote down a brief sentence, it got out, it got written out, everyone started using it and he did get the credit because he was the first person to write it down but him writing down e equals mc squared took a little bit longer to get to and i guess again back back when he first devised this this was like the beginning of the 19th of the 20th century right so 1920s and then he continued working on it through the two world wars right okay and so but i mean they didn't really have a lot of practical applications and ways to even test this out so much? Well, in astronomy we're starting to figure it out and with, what's kind of amazing is they did have to use all these sorts of things when they're starting to figure out the quantum mechanics of what drove stars, when they're looking to figure out nuclear uh, nucleosynthesis in stars. Um, this, this is, there, there's a lot of ideas that this influences. You need to have this energy idea, this, this linking between mass and energy to start to consider nuclear nucleosynthesis, nuclear reactions, nuclear bombs. It's, it's the foundation for a lot of very scary and powerful, and I mean that literally, powerful ideas. Right. And so I guess you have the situation where the astronomers are like, we don't know how stars work. We think they burn because you can't well, get that Eddington much energy. Well, had figured it out, right? <laughs> but we were still working on the details. Right. Eddington did some good work for us in, in the turn of the century. They're all right. compatriots of each other. Right. But you get a situation where, um, where you finally have a mechanism. You can understand a little bit better what that mechanism is and, and what that relationship is. But, but of course, I mean, I think that where a lot of people really think about e equals mc squared, they think about the, the nuclear program in the, uh, for World War II. Right. And, and this is where, um, when, when you think of TNT, when you think of plastic explosives, when you think of most conventional weapons, you're looking at a chemical reaction that, um, when it takes place, gives off huge amounts of energy compared to like mixing hair dye, which re releases a small amount of energy. This is why they say tear the cap off of the hair dye before you mix it. Sorry if that was a little esoteric for all you men out there. Um, you dye a lot of hair, Pamela, so we know I that's do all dye mind. a lot of hair, yeah. yes. Um, so, so lots of chemical reactions give off energy. A lot of them also will, will take energy from their environment and the container the reaction's going, on, going in will feel cold. But if a reaction is exothermic enough, energetic enough, it will release energy that actually shatters the chemical reaction going on. It, it releases so much kinetic energy into the system that things blast apart but this is a chemical reaction. It it's, has to do with the binding energies of the chemicals involved um, and that binding energy getting transformed into kinetic energy and thermal energy. With nuclear reactions, you're just taking the atoms apart and, and taking the energy of the atoms and releasing that. And, and that's a lot more powerful than just a standard chemical bond of whatever sort you're dealing with. And so now you've gone from the potato powering via chemical means a light for a science fair project to all the energy in the potato powering New York City. And so, and you really are getting that, that, that conversion of the, of the mass into energy of the potato. The matter were into you, energy. The matter into energy, yeah. Were you to actually blow up that, that potato at a, at a nuclear level? <laughs> Right, and luckily potatoes resist this. But but the the other side of this that that I mean, everyone thinks about the death, the destruction, the the mayhem that you can do with with nuclear weapons, and and they look at the evil side of the equation. But what's kind of awesome is is the the converting energy into matter side of the equation. You and I are just frozen energy. We don't think of it that way. But when our universe formed, the entire universe was was nothing but energy and. It took 
the universe expanding and cooling for that energy to finally be able to freeze out into to matter, into electrons, protons, neutrons came in eventually. Uh, there was early nuclear reactions. And all of that was this transformation process of energy into matter. And, and today in our quest to try and understand the particle physics world, we're, we're taking particles, electrons, protons, colliding them at high velocities inside of various types of, of accelerators depending on what we're looking for. And it's in the energy of that collision that we look for the particles that come out of the energy, the kinetic energy that's transformed into something that we may not have realized existed before. And so what is the process? I mean, we talk about, about turning energy into matter and matter into energy. What is the process to actually turn uh, say, energy into matter, for example. How can science do it now? Well, it, it's a matter of, of overcoming the forces in the center of, of the nuclei. Um, normally, you have protons and, protons and neutrons in the center of the atom that, that are held together with gluons because we are boring in how we name the, the things that hold our atoms together. But at the same time, they are repelling each other. This, this is... Um, the, the strange dichotomy that, that causes atoms to get more and more unstable as they get larger and larger. And, and eventually, when an atom gets too large, it, it's unstable, it splits into something more stable. Now, if you're able to take and squish those particles together even more, eventually you overcome their ability to, to be stable and, and separate from one another. And in that moment of, of being crushed, um, they're, they're forced to become energy. So you're overcoming the nuclear forces inside of the atom. Right, and so you've got a, and, and like how practically do they do this, say, in a nuclear reactor? Well, in a nuclear reactor, they don't bother with the full atom. They strip it out to its simplest pieces. So you take two protons. Um, you collide the two protons with so much um, force that, that in the moment that they come together, the ability of, of the protons to repel one another is overcome by the fact that they're already flying together. That force of repelling doesn't have the time to, to slow the, the interaction enough. And as they come together, they end up getting converted into pure energy as they smash and they can no longer exist as protons. And so, you know, and it's, again, of you know, almost the most efficient way to do this. I mean, the most efficient way is the matter-antimatter. Um, but you have to have already built your antimatter in the first place, right, which is complicated. Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure that, that there's, there's any uh, more or less efficiency in it. They're just different. So in both cases, you're releasing energy, and, and it's eventually freezing out as particles, but... But yeah, creating antimatter is there, and and they're just different. <laughs> and so, and then let's go. Let's go the other way, right? Let's go from from matter into energy. Well, this this is one of those neat parts where if you have a pile of energy hanging around, it will naturally collapse into a particle and antiparticle. Um, that, that have conserved momentum and fly off in opposite directions. And this is, this is something that's going on all the time. There's reactions under, um, bleh, there are reactions ongoing on a regular basis where, where we have, um, for instance, uh, beta decay and anti-beta decay processes where neutrons break down into a proton and electron and anti-electron neutrino, uh, conserving the momentum, conserving the charge, conserving all the little bits. There's all these conservation rules that we have to pay attention to. And, and one of the things people don't really seem to acknowledge is there's antiparticles everywhere. They're generally anti-neutrinos, but they're everywhere. And, and a little bit of antimatter is not going to hurt you. A little bit of anti, right? Well, don't, <laughs> they, use, they use it for medicine, right? They, they, took a little, they, they drop a little bit of antimatter in your body and, and watch as it explodes inside well, of you. <laughs> no, they usually take a little bit of normal radioactive matter that as it undergoes radioactive decays does release beta particles and well, I thought there was a and, there was a form of of it that where they they have uh, was it positronic emission technology anyway um, but but yeah so I mean the, the point is that that I mean scientists are using antimatter in their sort of daily yeah. work these days 
and and we're not blowing up the planet. It's Everything. really not a concern. Antimatter exists. We're not really sure why regular matter is the dominant in the universe. Folks are working on it, but but the reality is antimatter is everywhere. It's just the minority form of matter. Don't but, hate on the antimatter. But but there are free floating antiparticles every now and then hitting your body and detonating. I think detonating is probably too strong a word. In Annihil general, Annihil the, annihilating, right? That's the word, annihilating. <laughs> so, so in, in general, the, the anti-neutrinos that are passing through your body, um, they don't want to interact with anything. They don't want to do you any harm. They are the most antisocial of particles. And, and so the probabilities that, that anything bad is going to happen, the probabilities that we can even detect these suckers when we try is very low. So, so we don't need to be worried. And yeah, positrons happen too. They can do damage. This is why one should avoid radiation. But what's a few nucleotides among friends? So what were the sort of, uh, I guess, the moral implications of, uh, of this equation? I know that it caused Einstein quite a lot of, I don't know, he was quite sad, I think, when he started to realize what the implications of this technology or what of this equation we're going to be used yeah. for in, in terms of great destruction, right? Well, it, I mean, that, that's, that's the problem, that science can be used for good and it can be used for evil, and morality doesn't often keep up with technology. And there's always the question of, uh, well, dominance, and, and humans like to be dominant over one another. And here he was working to understand all the science that would eventually lead to so many positives. GPS, we have GPS because we have relativity. Um, understanding the formation of our universe is grounded in understanding relativity. But the other side of that was realizing, well, it, exactly how fusion and fission can occur, realizing how to form hydrogen bombs and how to form nuclear we weapons from plutonium and uranium, depending on your methods. And, and it was this realization that we can cause runaway nuclear reactions if we trigger them correctly that was the foundation of the Manhattan Project during World War II. And if it had only been used as a look at how big a stick we have, now everyone be quiet and stop fighting that would have been better, but the reality is we dropped two bombs on Japan, and I'm not going to argue the morality of that. I wasn't alive, I haven't studied it in detail, but the reality is we now live in a society where there is an ease of obtaining nuclear materials, and it is possible to conceive of the crazy intelligent suicide terrorist who creates the weapon in a suitcase. Luckily, the technologies are hard to, to get a hold of. They're extremely expensive to get a hold of. But as miniaturization takes place, as technology drops in price, we have to be concerned of a future where the suicide bomber isn't carrying TNT or plastic explosives. The suicide bomber is carrying a dirty weapon. And that's a terrifying future. And we can only hope to try and avoid it. Yeah, I mean, you can just imagine what they must have been wrestling with as they started to realize the implications of this, of the math, of the physics that they were uncovering on, <clears throat> that on the one hand, it was clearly possible to use this for great, you know, power plants and reactors, and you could power ships and cities with this, in, but when they didn't really understand wrong. the. I mean, they did, yeah, of course. But they didn't understand the waste issues and all that kind of stuff at, at that point. But they could see that it would be used for great good. And then on the other hand, you you detonate these things, and and then you're using them for great evil. And and how do you communicate this to to the politicians? Because at the end of the day, it's just nature, right? It's just reality and, says this all works, and. and and it's this horrible trade-off. I'm a strong advocate of, of safe nuclear energy. The problem is that what is right and what is safe and what is good is often destroyed in the face of what is cheap and how do we make the most money. Mm 
and and because humans aren't perfect there's always going to be that person who who looks at the trade-off of probabilities the if we don't spend this hundred thousand dollars there is a fractional increase in um, potential hazard if it and those sorts of decisions the the decision not to spend the money for reprocessing all of these decisions add up to a society that's not ready to be fully responsible for nuclear energy and and we live on a geologically unstable world and so that requires even further expenditures and further risk and and this is something that Japan is struggling with greatly right now it's a small nation it's it's one of the most in environment, environmentally conscious nations in the world, they even tell you how to correctly recycle lipstick. They have a it's special, not a nation. special box just for the <laughs> lipstick. Yeah, it's 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 really something to be be profoundly proud of. But at the same time, they're such a small nation; they need nuclear energy. But they're a geologically unstable nation, and they're a technologically driven high energy demand nation and now they're trying to struggle how do we balance the geological instability with the desire to not use coal or other chemical fuels that increase the carbon load in our atmosphere and and this is is a we have the technology we don't have the money do we have the understanding and it's trying to balance all of these different things and it, it always reminds me of Dante who who just to bring in like things from left field he said the root of sin is not understanding the consequences of our actions and and you have to wonder if 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 the root of doing wrong to our planet is is buried in not understanding all the scientific implications of our work yeah it's it's amazing that we're still dealing with the implications of of this discovery yeah and i think and i yeah. think you know when when you say equals mc squared that 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 is just a short form to, to sort of unleash this whole complex constellation of ideas all at the same time that that it's about death and it's about World War II and it's about the power and risks and Fukushima and and all these things all at the same time and and but yet, it's also about life it's, yeah. it's about stars so, it's about yeah. the origins of the Big Bang and it's that dichotomy that as scientists we always have to be concerned what is it that we're discovering yeah and yeah. and variable stars are a nice safe place to work. <laughs> well, I think that was great. Well, thank you very much, Pamela, and we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you next week. My pleasure, Fraser. Now, don't go away. We're just saving our recordings. Yeah. Hmm. My mic was a little hot on that one. Sorry, Preston. Okay, so me. Nicole. And Scott started Skyping about no pants just as we started talking about Fukushima. And the two of them are going to die later. I mean this in the best of ways. Like, like you're going to drop a nuclear bomb on them? No, no. Like I'm going to threaten to take away their cookies or something. Mm. I don't know. All right. We're in the nuclear age. You can do it. Um, all right. Cool. Uh, so some there were some interesting conversations going on in the in the uh, in the comments that I was watching. It's funny. Uh, and Thad Zabo, Doctor Thad Zabo is. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna invite him. Let me see if I can do that. He may not want to join us, but if he wants to, he can. Um, <laughs> uh, and Phoenix, hey Phoenix, is. Posting. Uh, don't worry about getting people to plus one. We actually can see the number of viewers that we have on every show. We can we actually get a little number at the top of the, uh, of the top of the window that tells us how many viewers. So we no longer have to beg for plus ones. And and I admit I'm not following the comments because that would make my head explode. He filters my reality for me. Okay, so let's hit you with some questions, Pamela. Um, uh, so Andrew Planet asks, could regular matter be dominant over antimatter because you need to apply a lot of energy to matter to create it into antimatter by giving it the correct spin and only the, then do you get antimatter? So could, could let's oh. say, let's say we had, you know, super duper antimatter machines rolling 24-7. Could we push the dominance of antimatter in the universe to flip it to the other side? No. No? No. Hey, Thad. Hey, Hi, I saw you. I, I, our video. Adjust. I went to see more than from here up. 
we saw you ex explaining in the in the comments, so I thought I would bring. It. So, Dr. Thad Zay, but where are you where are you located again? I'm at Cerritos College, which is uh, in the Los Angeles area. So, and it's our first day of classes today, so looking slightly spiffier. I don't know. So, <laughs> um, so no. So you think that uh, that that? So I guess the question then is. Um, I guess I guess Andrew's getting at why could regular matter be dominant over antimatter because you need to apply a lot of energy to create it. So, I mean, but I guess the point being that antimatter and matter were created in sort of equal-ish quantities at the beginning of the universe, right? They were. And and where we're confused is exactly what was it that caused basically for every one billion antimatter there's a billion matter and sorry for every one billion antimatter there's a billion and one bits of matter that that created the um, background energy and and the remaining matter we're, we're still trying to understand that break in symmetry um Jeff Borst noted that uh, positron emission tomo tomography, which tomography. is what I was talking about. Yeah, and that's 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 antimatter, isn't it? That's positrons. Right. Yeah. So you prepare a uh, you prepare a nuclear sample, and so this is one of the the reasons that if you're going in for any kind of uh, a PET scan or an MRI or anything like this, they give you a very specific time that you have to come into the hospital to do it because there's a nuclear sample that's prepared specifically for you. It's radioactive, and the way it decays is you're taking, let me see if I can remember this correctly, um, so you're taking a proton and by the weak interaction the proton becomes a neutron, a positron, and an electron. Right? And so the positron is then escapes and you can detect the radiation from where it is. So maybe you do this with something that's like iodine and so that concentrates in your thyroid and then you can get a picture of um, the thyroid specifically because that's the only place in the body that uses um, iodine in that quantity. So you prepare a nuclear sample. Um, it's not like, okay, we're going to inject you with antimatter. That doesn't happen. Um, but we inject you with something that can then decay uh, by something that emits a positron, which is antimatter, and then you can look at the energy that's coming from that radioactive decay. Cool. Um... Let's see. So, okay, so Ilya Sarah asks, is it a possibility, this one's for Pamela, uh, that all the missing antimatter is somewhere in the unobservable universe? That breaks the cosmological principle, which says everything everywhere is the same when averaged out of for large enough volumes. This is so, the homogeneity, and we did a whole episode on this. Well, not me, yes. I wasn't here for it, but but you did yeah. with Chris. Exactly. So, yes, it's entirely possible as long as the whole concept of homogeneity is wrong. Is that right? Uh, that right. right, and that's a pretty yeah. big what if, so I'm, I'm going to say no. Right. Um, all right, I'm going to move on. Let's see, what else did we get? Uh... Okay, so Bad Moon Ryzen 138 asks, uh, can you collide two neutrons together and have the same effect as protons? Anyone? Technically, yes, but it's difficult to do. I mean, neutron, there are some... How do you accelerate them? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there, there, I think there have been some a few experiments where they've done neutron-neutron beams, but we... we uh, yeah, exactly, that's a the thing. There's... The way the particle accelerators work, you, you basically have a large positive charge on one side and a large negative charge on the other side. And so your protons are essentially leaping off where the positive charge is toward the negative charge. Your simplest idea of a, a particle accelerator. For neutron, what do you do? I mean, yeah, there's, there's no charge, so you can apply an electric field to it all you want. It's going to go, yep, yeah, that's there. Big deal. I'm not moving. So... So, right, and so I guess the, with a traditional particle accelerator, you need those fields to be able to, to get these particles moving. So, so how would you accelerate a neutron that refuses to budge? Right. And so, I mean, one thing with, with nuclear physics, though, is um, when you look at the runaway 
uh, nuclear reactions, or even what's used in nuclear fuel. It's uh, U-235 or U-238, U-235 for... And any terrorist watching, watching, they can get this from anywhere. This isn't me telling you how to build a nuclear bomb. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> it releases... Scientists don't keep secrets. No, no. Um, it releases neutrons, and if the neutron's traveling at the right speed, it can get caught by another nucleus. And so now this nucleus catches a neutron, and it releases more neutrons. And those are caught by other nuclei, and they release more and more, and you get this runaway reaction. So the difference between a nuclear reactor and a nuclear bomb is we put stuff in a reactor that eats up some of these neutrons. Or we do something so that it's less likely the neutrons will get caught by other atoms. So that way the reaction proceeds at a slightly slower rate, and we heat things to steam instead of blowing up a city. Um, let's see. So... We don't really get neutron neutron collisions. I guess it could happen. I'm sure that if you want to work out the quantum mechanical probabilities and the cross section scatterings and all, have at it. I'm not going to do it. Um, more more often than not, we see um, the effect of a neutron being captured by another nucleus, and uh, and this is the the typical process in a nuclear reactor or a nuclear weapon. Uh, Bill Strait asked, I never seem to catch these live, uh, what happened to the weekly space hangout? They went on hiatus. It's coming back. It's coming back probably within the next couple of weeks, mostly just yeah. because it's uh, it's about herding cats. So how do you get 10 uh, space journalists to all show up at the same time and, and present their news this week? I'm going to mute you, Pamela, with your Hi. typing. Sorry, sorry. Um, okay, uh, Rob Miller says, uh, I know that light has no rest mass, but I'll approach this as a thought experiment. Since light's path is affected by a gravitational field, can we assume that it's affected by the Higgs field? Whoa. No. So is light affected by the Higgs field? No. No, this is the difference between matter and mass equivalency. Light can have a mass equivalency that causes it to be affected by gravity but it doesn't have matter, so it doesn't interact with the Higgs boson. But if you freeze it out, then it will have Then matter. it isn't light anymore. Right. Then it's not light anymore. Yeah, no, I understand. That's but since light and mass are, matter are interchangeable, mass interchangeable, then, you know, it's just a different form. Is my, but, but the no. name changes, and yes. that matters. Right, but the point being the light is not being affected by the Higgs field. Uh, <laughs> Desislava uh, asks, uh, can you comment on the nuclear explosions in Angels and Demons and The Dark Knight Rises? No. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, I'm trying to think. They're carrying around a big... They're carrying around a big... I, I mean, I haven't seen Angels and Demons, uh, but I did see Dark Knight Rises, and there was like a big nuclear bomb. They were dragging around in a truck. Boom. They carried it out, dropped it from a. Anyway, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna ruin it for anybody. But, but you know, uh, the fact that it exists already ruins it for me. I'm not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see if I got any more questions. Um, we're running out of questions here. Uh, okay, so there are. Okay, I'm not. So W Donahue on uh, Twitter asks uh, the RHIC and the LHC accelerate ionized nuclei, are they producing any neutron collisions or mostly proton collisions? I guess that was, that was what we just, we just talked about. They're yeah, proton protons. collisions. Or even so, more crazy, these lead-lead collisions or lead-gold collisions, where essentially yeah. you pack so many of these particles into so small a space that they're starting to find new forms of nuclear matter that they never knew existed before. So, and, and these... The, these heavy collisions are taking place at places like Michigan State, which is my alma mater, where they hire undergrads to line up the lead bricks. But that can be scientific now that I've squeed about my alma mater. I, yeah, I, I haven't looked into it too much more to be able to, to say very much more. So, squee away. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sylvan uh, Westby uh, says, Yesterday's Space Hangout was terrific, the best so far. So many people, good seeing, four doctors, and lots of fun kudos. So that's exactly right. Uh, we had a really fun time last night with the uh, with the virtual star party, uh, which will I guess it, it will have shown up in in my YouTube feed and the University Today YouTube feed, and also over on 
on CosmoQuest. We got a big archive yeah. of all this stuff. And it was, yeah, it was a really good time. We had four telescope views. We had Phil Plate. We had Nicole. We had that. We had... We had Scott. We had um, Ray Sanders even got Ray the Pope scope, the <laughs> Vatican Observatory, to to take some yeah. photos for us. We had a special report from Amanda Bauer about the uh, about the fires in Australia. So no, it was a really good. It was a really good episode. I got to say, it was. It all came together really nicely, and and a lot of that stuff we want to do more of. You know, a lot of. Um, just having some more special special guests drop in and, and hang out with us and do some observing and talk about the science they do. So I think that's, hopefully you'll be able to see a lot more of that in the future. But again, herding cats, so. Um, it's what we do. It's what we do, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I think we're, why don't we wrap this up? I think we've, we've neared our hour. Thank you very much, Thad, for jumping in. I know you weren't expecting to get invited into an astronomy cast. Yeah, episode sure, thanks. This is uh, my break between lecture and <laughs> so. Perfect. We'd like to keep you uh, working, um, but uh, you can always see uh, Thad on uh, on the virtual star party nights on on Sunday nights with us, and uh, you know laying down the science. So it's great to see you and great to have you join us. Thank you so much, Pamela. Once again, it's great to be back in our freezing cold uh, studio spaces, recording. And uh, and I'm gonna fix the backlighting. I'm sorry, I forgot how low south the sun yeah. gets, and that's the south facing window. And your so. your camera your camera view is just terrible. Like, I'm not sure what it is, but the resolution, like, it's pixelated. I'm on wireless. I may need to change that. Yeah, I don't know what it is, whether it's the Mac or something. I'm not sure what it is. It's but... not the Mac. It's it's the Internet connection. This yeah. is the same computer I've always used. Yeah. Hmm. Um, oh, Graham is saying Google Plus questions. Graham, so I'm, uh, I don't understand your question, I guess, is the problem. Uh uh, and I'll throw it past the panel here, and I'll see. So uh, Graham asks, what do you guys know about Minkowski space, light cones, and the Drake equation? Off of that, is there any way to add the unknown from the Minkowski space into the Drake equation? Those three don't match. No, no. Yeah. That, that's astrobiology meets general relativity. No, I, I, no, you've <laughs> confused me. Right. I'm sorry, Graham. That was why I was sort of holding off your questions, because I didn't quite understand it. But, but I guess your, que your question being... The Drake equation. How does the Drake equation and light cones and Minkowski space all come together? What's Minkowski space? I've never even heard of that term before. It's a four-dimensional representation of space-time for solving special relativity equations. It's not even really employ employed in general relativity. So, if you're seeing special relativity for the first time in uh, an, an undergraduate physics course, um, you can go play in Minkowski space. Uh, but it's not like the the Riemann uh, manifolds that are, are used for it's a it's a very special case of uh, essentially like the Riemann manifolds used for um, general relativity. So we said we put time on this axis, we put spatial dimensions on this axis, and go make drawings. So yes, right, right. Um, but they kind of measure different things. They're used for different things. So yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks again, guys, and we will see you all. I don't know. What's what's happening next? Have we got... Um... So the next thing this week is Thursday with Emily Lakdawalla, uh, the Planetary Society Hangout. Uh, we will post the times as soon as we have the event information, then Sunday's virtual star party, and hopefully next week we'll return with a full lineup of Hangouts after our hiatus. Oh, Graham, don't be embarrassed. Uh, you've taught me about Minkowski space. I actually had no idea what that was. And I'll be thinking about it all day. So, uh, so Thursday um, is when we do the uh, is when Emily's doing that, and then Sunday night we do our virtual star party, and at some point the uh, weekly space hangout will return. So, and then back, and maybe we might drop in. We're a little couple of weeks behind, so we might drop in a couple more episodes of Astronomy Cast. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks, guys. It's great to see you. Okay. Take care. Thanks, thanks for watching, everybody. Okay.